Okay, hello and welcome back everyone to Grockets OGTV. This is the GMAT edition. We're going through the 12th edition to the guide to the test. Arrow pointing as a friendly reminder to you which uh, edition of the book you need in front of you. My name's Jim Jacobson, like it says up here, taught by Jim Jacobson with a picture of me that's probably too small for you to recognize me on the street. And uh, last time we finished up the critical reasoning section, so this time we are picking up um, further on in the book. We're in the last section that we're going to cover as part of these OGTV broadcasts. We are in the sentence correction section, and so we're just going to start that section today and get through. Um, we've scheduled 11 of those questions, so we'll see how that goes. Before I start, though, I wanted to say a few words about sentence correction strategy. So, uh, and it's not actually that different in a lot of ways from the way you might approach data sufficiency or critical reasoning. Uh, you definitely want to read the question first. There is no separate question from the passage, unlike critical reasoning, so everything is in there. You don't have to worry about which part to read first, um, anything like that. Um, read the question, reading carefully for potential areas of concern, not necessarily just um, the part that's underlined and what might be wrong with it, because um, you know, it may actually be correct as written. But given the way that the sentence is structured, make some predictions about what the issues might be. And of course, if you notice anything wrong with the sentence in your first read through, make a note of that and say, hey, you know, the correct answer really is going to need to have, you know, this form of the verb or um, needs to use a different pronoun or verb tense or parallelism, whatever it is, whatever the issues are, um, go into the answer choices with a prediction. Uh, then you can also do a vertical scan. So, you know, you have the, the problem and, um, of course, choice A is always what was written in the original sentence. Um, and then, you know, and I'm rewriting these even though they're written on the left there because uh, what you'll do is you'll do kind of a vertical scan of the answer choices. If you've identified any um, issues with the sentence as written where by virtue of what's not underlined in the sentence, you know what must be in the underlined portion, you can do a vertical scan for answer choices that fix that error and do a vertical scan for answer, for answer choices that repeat the same error that's in the original sentence on the assumption that there's an error and it's not correct as written. So on your, on your first go through, you may be able to, for example, eliminate A and C, you know, because the original one you identified as incorrect as written. You also recognize that choice C has the same error and you notice that, um, you know, B, D, and E have something different. Clearly, um, and it, you know, there will be uh, sentence correction questions where there really is only one error and you have to correct it. A small one where it's, you know, maybe just one word is underlined and you have to replace a single phrase. Um, other ones, the entire sentence is underlined and of course those are more challenging. And for those, there will be other errors introduced, either things that you didn't catch in the original sentence or other errors introduced in parts of um, the answer choices that do not repeat the error that you noticed. Um, <clears throat> so then it's a matter of process of elimination. You say, oh, well, B has this part wrong, so it's not B. D has this other thing wrong. Uh, so it, even though it's different from what was in A, what they put in there is still wrong, which gives us answer choice E. Um, and so, of course, as it says in the book, it, it tests a variety of grammar issues. Grammar issues are the ones that are easiest, I think, in general to spot because they follow hard and fast rules. Things that are wrong stylistically are a little bit tougher because there will be wrong answer choices on the GMAT that are grammatically correct. Things like active versus passive voice or uh, things that are considered wordy. Um, those are things that are grammatically correct. I mean, the passive voice is a perfectly acceptable grammatical form. And in real life, there are times when you really do want to use it. There are even times when it is correct on the GMAT. So by no means should you ever take something as being always 100% of the time wrong on the GMAT if it is a question of style rather than grammar. However, the GMAT absolutely has things that it prefers. It prefers parallelism. It prefers not that you not be wordy. It prefers that you don't use progressive tenses. Um, and we'll cover them as we run into them at, in, um, in, in the questions as we go through them. So, um, you know, the, the, it, where, where the GMAT gets trickier, at least in my opinion, is when it starts dealing with idioms. Um, idioms are things that are right or are wrong, you know, so it's not a question of grammar but of idiom. But those are either you know them or you don't. And um, if you are unfamiliar with the idiom, 
native speaker or no, it's going to be tricky. Uh, idioms can cause problems for native speakers as well, simply because we have sometimes have um, idioms that are somewhat similar, like, um, you know, uh, forbid versus prohibit. They're used in similar types of sentences. Um, people are prohibited from doing things, but forbidden to do things. And it's very easy as a native speaker to confuse the two in your mind, um, confusing the two prepositions, things like that. So, um, you know, don't, don't feel like you have a particular advantage or disadvantage. It's all about just what things you need to learn and what things you already you go into SC already knowing. I think that's enough time spent on general strategy. Um, let's actually start looking at some sentences and see what we get. So, starting off on page 658, big jump from where we were before in the critical reasoning section, question number one in the sentence correction. As before, I will be reading you the sentences, but I won't be putting them on the screen. Um, it is assumed that you have your own copy of the book in front of you, and um, yeah, so, I mean, you'll have to kind of follow along with what I'm saying. And I will still read the answer choices, you know, as we go through them. Uh, anyway, so number one. The Glasshouse Mountains in Queensland, Australia, were sighted in 1770 by the English navigator Captain James Cook, by whom they were named supposedly because its sheer wet rocks glistened like glass. First thing we need to do is identify if, if there are errors in the original sentence. One of the things we can notice immediately in the underlined section is that, uh, so it says, by whom they were named supposedly because its sheer wet rocks glistened like glass. We shift between they and its. And both of them should be referring to these glass house mountains. So one of the two is wrong. The mountains is, the mountains are plural. <laughs> uh, the, the proper noun glass house mountains is a plural proper noun. Uh, I guess if it had been the something range, the glass house range, it would have been singular. But, um, you know, and not that every plural noun that ends in, not that every noun that ends in s is automatically plural. We have, a, we have one coming up today, but then there's other ones like you know, debris, which if you aren't familiar with the word, that's a singular noun. Um, anyway, so we definitely need to get rid of all the answer choices that have its in there. So that get, allows us to get, to get, it allows us to get rid of, it allows us to get rid of a, a is not it. Um, all the rest have uh, there in them. So we did our vertical scan. It's is not repeated in any of the other answer choices. So, so much for that as a means of eliminating a lot of other answer choices. Um, the other issue does appear to be the initial phrase that starts, uh, or the, the thing that starts this phrase, you know, by whom they were named, supposedly because. So, um, by whom, um, when, when the phrase is set off by a comma like that, um, by whom is actually going to refer back to the subject of the sentence. Um, so, in this case, the glass house mountains. So, by whom isn't going to be correct either. The glass ho house mountains were not named by themselves, um, they didn't. They didn't name themselves. Uh, James Cook did. So we need who named them rather than so James, Captain James Cook, who named them rather than. So we need we need it to start with who rather than by whom. So B has by whom, and I know how to spell whom. Really, so B has by whom. Um, D and E both have who. Let's look at C naming them. Once again, um, when you have a modifying phrase and then you have that present participle, an ing participle like that, um, that actually can modify several different things. It either modifies everything that came before or it's going to typically go back and modify the subject of the sentence grammatically. So neither of those actually modifies um, uh, Captain James Cook, which is what we would want. So naming here is going to cause problems. So we have a, a choice between who so named them supposedly because their um, sheer wet rocks glistened like glass, or who so named it since supposedly. Oops, well, there is an it in choice E. We needed it to be a they because the mountains are plural. That allows us to get rid of E. Let's read choice D back in. The Glasshouse Mountains in Queensland, Australia, were sighted in 1770 by the English navigator Captain James Cook, who so named them supposedly because their sheer wet rocks glistened like glass. That sounds right, and it in fact is right. Choice D is our correct answer. Let us move on then to dun, 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 question number two. 
I suppose I could get in the habit of just erasing the question number since we'll be doing more questions per page. No, but then I'd have to erase everything else. Never mind, I'm just going to keep doing this. Okay, so this one looks like a longer one. Um, although various 18th and 19th century American poets had professed an interest in Native American poetry and had pretended, had pretended to imitate Native American forms in their own works, until almost 1900, scholars and critics did not begin seriously to study traditional Native American poetry in Native languages. So, again, we, we need to plug in our instinct meter and our grammar meter to determine whether this is correct as written. Um, Really, I think the, the thing that jumps out at me from this one, uh, at least as it's initially written, is having the phrase until almost 1900 set off by commas like that is pretty confusing. Um, normally, what you do with a phrase like that is would not you would not put a comma on the side that you wanted to modify. So if we wanted to say that um, they had pretended to imitate Native American forms in their own works until almost 1900, um, we would get rid of the comma before the phrase. If we want to make it clear that they, uh, that scholars and critics did not begin to seriously study the forms um, until almost 1900, we would get rid of the comma potentially after it, or move that phrase later into the phrase into the part that we wanted to modify, or move it earlier if we wanted it to modify the earlier thing. So having commas on both sides. <laughs> makes it really ambiguous what it's modifying, and the GMAT hates ambiguity of modification. Uh, and, I, you know, I'm totally with the GMAT on that one. Your writing should be clear. Anything that you say um, that's not clear, you've undercut your own message. And so, you know, this is why they include stylistic as well as grammatical things that they are looking for in SC questions. Anyway, so we need um, until 1900, or until almost 1900, to be clearly placed, and you know, by getting rid of one of the commas, and then we needed to not introduce any other errors. So let's just take a look. So uh, choice A has that until 1900 problem, which makes it icky. Uh, choice B, until almost 1900, scholars and critics had not begun seriously studying. Um, so we, because until almost 1900 is the, where they begin studying um, Native American poetry in those native languages. That's the thing that happens second. And the thing that happens first, you know, that the uh, 18th and 19th century poets had professed an interest, blah, blah, blah. That's the thing that happens first. That one's in the past perfect, had professed. Um, so the sequence of tenses demands that the thing that's more recent be in a tense that's closer to the present. Had begun, or had not begun in choice B, is also past perfect, which um, ruins our, our sense of tenses um, because we had past perfect in the not underlined part, the thing that happened before 1900. We just need the simple past in 1900 in the second part of the sentence in the underlined portion. So uh, the problem with choice B then is had not begun, the past perfect there is problematic because that um, muddies the, the, the sense of what things happened in what order. So choice B, naughty. Um, choice C, not until almost 1900 were scholars and critics to begin seriously to study. Well, you know, were to begin seriously to study um, too many infinitives, it's, it's definitely wordy. And wordy is not automatically grammatically incorrect, uh, but it's usually incorrect on the GMAT stylistically. The other thing is the, the um, idiom were to blank or, you know, are to, I was actually going to write out blank, oops, okay. This phrase, it, you know, they were to do this or they, uh, somebody else is to do this, um, that implies obligation, actually. That's, that's a, a verbal construction <clears throat> often seen in journalistic tenses like in newspapers, but it's used in regular writing too. Um, you know, somebody is to do something, it implies that they've been uh, ordered to do that or that they are somehow obligated. So uh, having this phrase in choice C does change the meaning of the sentence and we don't, don't want to do that. The only time you should be changing the meaning of the sentence is when the original version doesn't make sense. Um, 
So do be careful of wrong answer choices that change the sense of the sentence, if you're able to catch it, of course. <clears throat> so choice D. It was not almost until 1900 when scholars and critics began to seriously study. So this one correctly has the tense, the simple past tense, began to study. But there's this terrible phrase, it was not almost until 1900. Um, it was not almost until 1900. Um, uh, there's basically no way that I can say that, that that comes out as idiomatic in English, and that's because it's not. So it's not, not almost until 1900. Um, you know, obviously there are other ways of expressing the same idea in, in, the, uh, in the other answer choices even, and so choice D just terribly, that's wordy. And um, arguably not even English. So if, if something comes out and it's not English, that's not going to be the right answer choice. So process of elimination, even if we didn't actually recognize choice E as correct, if we had identified these other errors with choices A through D, we could choose E with confidence. But let's just read it anyway. It was not until almost 1900 that scholars and critics be seriously began studying. So we have the correct use of the past tense, simple past, because it's more recent than the first part of the sentence, which is in the pluperfect or past perfect. Um, we don't have some craziness with this not almost until 1900 stuff. <clears throat> and in every other respect, it doesn't introduce any new errors. So choice E is our correct one. You know what, I just realized I totally did number three in place of number two. Okay, so how about we do number two for real? Um, I guess I'm so used to the critical reasoning ones, you know, spent a couple of weeks on that, that uh, used to jumping down the page more. So this one really is question number two. Really, I mean it. Okay. Although a surge in retail sales have raised hopes that there is a recovery finally underway, many economists say that without a large amount of spending, the recovery might not last. So immediately one of the first things that we can recognize about this one is that the subject of the sentence is a surge in retail sales. A surge is singular, um, but the, the verb in the underlined portion is have raised. A surge have raised is not grammatically correct. We need a singular form of the verb. So um, we can immediately tell that have raised is the problem with A. So we need surge has raised. And um, doing a quick vertical scan of the rest of the answer choices, none of the other ones repeat the same error. So unfortunately, we're only able to eliminate choice A on the basis of what's there. Um, and, you know, I guess the other thing about choice A is, you know, hopes that there is a recovery. Um, I would say that the there is is potentially wordy. It's not grammatically incorrect, but it's extra words and the GMAT hates extra words. So anyway, choice A was already wrong, just there's another reason it's wrong. So choice B, um, <clears throat> a surge in retail sales raised hopes for there being a recovery finally underway. So be very suspicious on the GMAT of the words being and having. They're not grammatically incorrect, but um, these kind of progressive tenses, uh, especially with um, kind of states of, states of being, um, they are almost always extra words. And, you know, like I said, the GMAT hates those. So uh, the only time that you're likely to see being and having cor uh, in correct answer choices are when they're the subject of the sentence, like, you know, being a firefighter is no easy task, something like that. So um, that's one place where you could have it correct. The other time is in negative constructions. So you would might say, you know, without being too nosy, I want to ask how your weekend was or something like that. Obviously, that's not going to be a GMAT sentence. They don't ask you about your weekend on the test. But uh, negative constructions do call for um, uh, uh, present participles like this would being. Um, so just be careful of those. On this one, um, raised hopes for there being a recovery finally underway clearly is wordy. 
and and that's actually the objection to the progressive tenses. Um, it's not that the GMAT just doesn't like them for some other reason. They introduce other words for ideas and uh, that, that could be expressed some other way. Choice B, not it. Uh, choice C, a surge in retail sales had raised hopes for a recovery finally being underway. So once again, we've got our wrong answer choice buddy being in there. And then also the, the, the uh, past perfect tense had raised. The only time you're going to see that past perfect tense is when you're putting something further in the past than a main verb in the simple past. And this is the, um, all of this is in, all of this is in the present tense. So, you know, um, although a surge in retail sales, so that's a current thing or a recent past thing, and then many economists say that's present tense. So past perfect tense totally out of place in this sentence. And so choice C is totally out of place for our roster of potentially correct answers. Um, choice D, although a surge in retail sales has raised hopes that a recovery is finally underway. Okay, so has raised is present perfect, but it's the present part of present perfect that we care about. Um, has raised puts it uh, potentially contemporaneous or up, up into the recent past with the main verb say, economists say. So has raised is good. And uh, we have is rather than being, you know, being was naughty. So choice D, we shall keep in the running. And then choice E, raised hopes for recovery finally. Let me read that one in actually with more context. Although a surge in retail sales raised hopes for a recovery finally underway. Um, interesting. So um, I'm not sure that this is actually grammatically incorrect. It does slightly change the, the meaning of the sentence. It's certainly an unusual way to phrase this type of construction. Um, but also, um, if you're raising hopes for a recovery finally underway, the way that that's constructed, it suggests that the recovery does in fact already exist, and hopes are going up for this thing that already exists, when its existence is really what's in question. So. Um, the, 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 there's a reason why every other answer choice has some form of the verb to be. Um, we have is, being, being, is. I should put those in a different color. Um, oops, here. <laughs> um, that's because that's what the hope is. The hope is that this thing exists. If you take out the um, that verb of being, the hope is for something else. The hope is sort of other hopes for it, you know, hopes that it will continue, hopes that it will be successful, hopes that it will be big. Um, without that verb to be, it changes what we're hoping for, and that changes the meaning of the sentence, and that's usually naughty. So choice D is our correct answer. Okay, so now we really can move on to the second column, page 658, question number four. And I will really do question number four. Of all the vast tides of migration that have swept through history, maybe none is more concentrated as the wave that brought 12 million immigrants onto American shores in little more than three decades. So the part that's underlined, maybe none is more concentrated as. Clearly this violates, um, uh, well, it's basically a mixture of two idioms. So we can say, um, you know, X is as y as z and we can also say x is more y than z um, and the um, I think in the as one we do actually need the y thing in here but you could actually say, just say x is more than z, for example. So characterizing what in what way it's more is kind of optional. But when you have more, um, in a comparison, when you're comparing two things, you do need a than when you use more. Uh, or any other comparative adjective, you know, like bigger um, or, uh, you know, 
more expensive. Um, so you can say, I bought a bigger house. You don't need than every time you have a comparative adjective, but um, if you're comparing it to something else, I bought a house that's bigger than the last one I, I owned, or that's bigger than any other house that I've owned, then you do need a than. You know, I bought a more expensive car. You can say that without than, but you could say I bought a car that's more expensive than my budget really allowed for. So uh, when it's in a comparison, more requires than. And I guess the difference between these mathematically is x, x is as y as z is saying the two things are equal. x is more y than z is greater than. So um, you need to make sure that whichever thing, whichever idea you're actually trying to express, it, you're using the right idiom for it. So uh, in this particular sentence, we are saying uh, there, there was no tide of migration more concentrated than this $12 million, $12 million, $12 million immigrant one. So clearly, this is the idiom that we're after. x is more y than z, or just x is more than z, or x is more than y, if you would rather just go with consecutive variables. So having maybe none is more concentrated as the wave, um, more as is naughty, so it's not A. Um, choice B has the same thing, so it's not B. It says it may be that none is more concentrated as. Uh, so we got rid of choices A and B just on the basis of that error. Um, and you know, choice B also starts with it may be that, um, which is grammatically correct, but wordy. So you know, B is doubly wrong. So now we have, the rest of them, we have none more than. So all three of the remaining answer choices have the correct idiom, and therefore two of the three remaining answer choices have introduced other errors. Let's look. So choice C says, perhaps it is none that is more concentrated than. Well, I mean, I don't think it takes a rocket surgeon to see that that has way more words. Um, perhaps it is none that is more concentrated. Um, yeah, that, I, no. Uh, choice D, maybe it is none that was more concentrated than. So this changes the tense. Um, it is none that was more concentrated. We change the tense twice, so we go from, or change it, uh, well, we change it once and use two different tenses. So we have is and was, which is kind of strange. And then uh, it's also wordy again. That, introdu that introducing that other little passive construction, it is none more concentrated, uh, not really helping. And so again, process of elimination gets us to E. Perhaps none was more concentrated than. So it's the most concise of the answer choices. Well, I guess choice A might have been more concise, but it had the incorrect idiom. But of the potentially correct ones, it's the most concise. Which brings me to one of the rules of thumb that I usually give. Um, and granted, this is no substitute for actually knowing the right answer. But when in doubt, if you just have no other way of deciding, go with the most concise answer. There will be a number of times where the GMAT, where the correct answer is the one that has the most words because that's the only one that's grammatically correct or stylistically correct. However, if you have no other basis for choosing, go with the one that has fewer words. Now, in this particular case, we were able to identify it, you know, as the correct answer based on more than, um, we were able to identify errors in the wrong answer choices. But, um, if you just can't decide, let conciseness decide for you. Because then that time that you save in, in that decision, rather than sitting there and agonizing about it, that time that you save can go towards getting another question right somewhere else that you actually have a chance of getting right. Because really, I think more so than um, reading comprehension or uh, critical reasoning, you really can just end up stumped um, in sentence correction where Two, I mean, with critical reasoning, you end up with two similar answers. You can kind of go back to issues of scope of the question um, and, and, uh, and look for other ways to kind of see your way into it. With sentence correction, especially with something like an idiom um, or where you just don't know which construction is right, um, you could just, you can be down to a coin flip rather than sitting there and racking your brains, just choose the one that's more concise and move on and, and use that extra time to get one right later. Anyway. Uh, number five, 
Diabetes, together with its serious complications, ranks as the nation's third leading cause of death, surpassed only by heart disease and cancer. Okay, so we have um, the subject. This is uh, just sort of one of these general things that we need to watch out for. Subject, modifying phrase. Wow, that's sloppy. Modifying phrase and then the verb. The common, this is a common GMAT technique for causing subject-verb mismatches. The further they separate the subject from the main verb, the subject clearly is diabetes, the main verb is ranks. So the more things they put in between there, um, that's they're counting on people to confuse which, which should be which. So we can actually expect, so diabetes is singular. Here's another noun that ends in S, that's singular in, ends in S and is singular. Um, and even if you didn't know that, let's just say you, you had never heard of diabetes before, uh, the word it's in the modifying phrase tells you that it's singular. So even if you had never seen the word before, you had another clue as to its um, number. Uh, diabetes should, diabetes ranks. Wow, I'm just skipping letters left and right today. I guess it's it really does seem to be more prominent when I'm talking when I'm writing. So diabetes ranks. We can cross off all the answer choices that don't have the correct form of the verb. So choice B has rank. That can't be it. Um, and D has R. R the nation's third leading cause of death. That's another plural. We can get rid of that. Um, and we can get rid of E. Have been ranked. So choices B, D, and E, we, we got rid of three answer choices just on the basis of noticing the subject-verb agreement. So again, if you notice that uh, when you're reading the, the original sentence, just make a mental note, hey, subject-verb agreement, regardless of other errors that I see, I'm going to eliminate answer choices based on that. Now we really just have to decide between A and C. If we can make no other determinations, we have a 50% chance of getting this question right, which is pretty awesome. So. Uh, we have diabetes ranks as the nation's third lead, leading cause of death surpassed only. Um, and then C, uh, has the rank of the nation's third leading, third leading cause of death only surpassed? So let's leave, I mean, choice C does have kind of that wordier has the rank versus ranks, which already makes choice C suspicious. But the, we have the difference between um, only surpassed In C and in A we have surpassed only by blah 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 by heart disease and cancer and this is a pretty important distinction uh, that, that shows up several times even just throughout the official guide so uh, where to put your adverbs it actually does matter um, and only is a restrictive adverb. Uh, it limits in some way the word that it's modifying. In choice C, we are it's modifying uh, surpassed. So in this case, diabetes was only surpassed by uh, heart disease and cancer, as opposed to um, doubled or something like that, tripled. You know, diabetes was the death toll from diabetes was tripled by heart disease and cancer. So. You know, in this particular case, there aren't too many things that could go beyond surpassing. So, you know, context makes it more tempting to choose only surpassed. But um, in other contexts, the only could really be placing a very specific limit on the verb where something more extensive was, was really possible. So the difference then is choice A, surpassed only. It was surpassed, but only surpassed by these two things. So the only is limiting the two things that surpassed it. So instead of it was surpassed by 23 other diseases, it was surpassed only by two diseases. So um, the placement of only, when it's before the verb, it's going to modify the verb and limit that, saying that that's what happened, not something further. And if it's after the verb, it's going to limit um, like what the direct object of the verb is or the extent to which the verb happened, things like that. So uh, choice C, um, the placement of only is um, not helpful um, <clears throat> and, um, and makes it wrong, whereas choice A has the correct placement. And that's the correct answer.
So on to page 659, number six. In late 1997, the chambers inside the pyramid of the pharaoh Menkaure at Giza were closed to visitors for cleaning and repair due to moisture exhaled by tourists, which raised its humidity to such levels so that salt from the stone was crystallizing and fungus was growing on the walls. <clears throat> uh, this one does not sound right to me on the first read-through. Um, there's a couple things that, that, that I would say jump out at me. Uh, Usually, when you're going to do something was, you know, closed due to, um, I, I think most uh, most of the times that I've seen it, we, we have a noun phrase, due to rain, or due to, you know, sickness, sickness of the lead singer. So it's a noun phrase rather than a whole, um, I guess, moisture exhaled by tourists. Um, but really, it's the effect of the moisture um, exhaled by tourists. So having it closed due to moisture um, is a little suspicious. The bigger issue, um, however, is that so the chambers were closed, which raised its humidity to such levels. Its Chambers is, sing is plural, um, so having its in there as a singular in the underlined portion is clearly wrong. Um, so due to is one suspicious point, its is another, and then the third one, um, which raised its humidity to such levels so that, well, actually so that is the third one, uh, we would probably just raised its humidity to such levels that, um, don't need the, the so, it could just be um, raised it to such levels that X happened. So, so that is a problem. And um, salt from the um, stone walls was crystallizing and fungus was growing. Okay, well that's at least parallel, so that's fine. Anyway, it's enough problems with choice A that I think we can get rid of it. Uh, choice B, we have the, the due to moisture, which I don't like um, because it's wordier than because. You know, it's two words instead of one. Um, and also it has its in it again. Its alone is enough of a reason to get rid of B. Also, um, the end of choice B, uh, it's humidity to such levels that, notice we have that rather than so that, so that one's fixed in B, but it says salt from the stone would crystallize and fungus was growing on the walls. Because there we have these, these two results of the humidity going up, that salt was crystallizing and fungus was growing, those two things really ought to be parallel. So, um, you know, it was correct in choice A, stone was crystallizing and fungus was growing, but in choice B, we have stone, uh, salt from the stone would crystallize. So, parallelism is another reason to get rid of B. Uh, C, because. So because is basically always better than due to on the GMAT because it's one word instead of two. So because tourists were exhaling moisture, which had raised the humidity within them to levels such that salt from the stone would crystallize. So we definitely have that parallelism issue again. Parallelism. And within them is, um, because we have it in a separate uh, phrase set off by a comma, um, the them is going to likely refer to the next previous um, plural noun, which in this case is tourists. So the tourists were exhaling moisture, which had raised the humid humidity within tourists to levels such that the salt from the stone. And so uh, the them is a little suspect. Grammatically, you could still argue that it goes back to the previous one, but since it's a little ambiguous, the GMAT's not going to like it, and the parallelism already made choice C wrong. Uh, D, because of moisture that was exhaled by tourists raising the humidity within them uh, to levels so high as to make the salt from the stone crystallize. So um, this one's better because the within them is not in a phrase set off by a comma. It's in it, its own modifying phrase, which then should potentially have them go back to um, chambers, which is where we want it to go. However, we still have the parallelism issue. We need um, 
stone was crystallizing and fungus was growing. So really, we could have just gone down and eliminated all the other answer choices that didn't have that. But again, part of my job is pointing out all the errors, um, because really, you don't actually have to identify all the errors in a given answer choice. You only need to, answer, to identify one error in an answer choice. That is enough to mark it wrong. Um, anyway, choice E, process of elim elimination, gets us there again. Because moisture exhaled by tourists had raised the humidity within them to such levels that salt from the stone was crystallizing and fungus was growing on the walls. So that correct, it has our correct parallelism. It has because instead of due to. Um, the within them phrase is part of the first, um, is, is still part of all the same sentence, which would go back to the subject of the sentence and is in general the clearest um, and most concise version of what's going on. Oh, and it also refers correctly, it refers to the chambers as them rather than its. Okay. 659, number seven. As its sales of computer products have surpassed those of measuring instruments, the company has become increasingly willing to compete for the mass market sales they would in the past have conceded to rivals. So, um, Here's another one where we have the subject, and then all sorts of words, and then we have the verb. The subject in our, in our sentence is the company, and the verb that we have from uh, the sentence as written is um, uh, has become, so in this case, um, oh actually, sorry, haha. <laughs> I'm totally thinking of something else. We don't really have that big separation between the subject and the verb. We have a big separation between the subject and the pronoun that refers to it. We have the company, and it goes all the way forward to market sales they would in the past have conceded to rivals. Um, you could argue that a company is made up of individuals, and if you really wanted to emphasize that, there are instances where you could use they correctly in... Um, standard written English to refer to the company, but by default, the company is a singular noun, and especially in American English, the default is to go with the number of the noun, even if it's people. So we would say the jury took its sweet time coming to a decision, whereas you know perhaps in British English, they would say the jury took their sweet time. They probably wouldn't even use the phrase took their sweet time, but I'm not British, so I can't tell you what they would really say. Um, in any case, American English and therefore GMAT English prefers that singular nouns have singular pronouns. We can get rid of all answer choices that have the word they in them. So A is wrong, uh, B is wrong, and okay, uh, that, get, that gets rid of two answer choices and we have our odds down to one and three on the basis of one little word. Always a good deal. Um, so then we have um, so B had, they would have conceded previously to their rivals. Their was in there twice, which is naughty. So C, that in the past would have been conceded previously to rivals. Um, really, you don't have to, this is extra words to say previously and in the past. One or the other is enough. Uh, and actually choice D does the same thing. It has the previously and the past, which really puts us down to choice E already it would in the past have conceded to rivals. So we have it for the pronoun replacing company, and we only have one phrase, uh, and we even used the wordier of the two. Previously uses fewer words than in the past, um, but choice E has, you know, in the past as opposed to previously. So this is a good example to show that the GMAT does not always choose the absolute most concise thing in every case. You're simply being asked to choose the best and most correct answer choices of the ones you're given. It's kind of a fun exercise sometimes to think about, you know, when you're doing untimed practice on your own, think about how you could make the sentence even shorter um, using what you know about what the GMAT prefers. However, this is not the time for that. Choice E, then, is the correct answer. So 659, number 8. The widely accepted Big Bang Theory holds that the universe began in an explosive instant 10 to 20 billion years ago and has been expanding ever since. So this is a compound verb. So we have the widely expected, widely expected, haha, <laughs> widely accepted Big Bang Theory is the subject. Big Bang Theory. And then we have two verbs. Um, 
or we have one main verb, holds, and it holds two things. It holds that the universe began, um, um, and has been expanding. Uh, note that this is not necessarily a problem with parallelism. Um, because you know when you talk about parallel parallelism, the verbs do not have to be exactly in the same form. Um, they just need to uh, be kind of grammatically parallel. Both of them are referring back to universe. Um, began takes place before has been expanding um, because it had to begin before it could expand. So these do reflect reflect a chronology and have slightly different tenses, um, but they're parallel in that um, they're both uh, simple forms of. Uh, Ver, they're both uh, parallel verb forms referring to universe. Um, yeah, so it probably would have been unusual to say began and had done something else, having a pluperfect uh, taking place after began. Anyway, so we can keep A in the running, but let's see if anything improves on that. So uh, choice B, the widely accepted Big Bang Theory holds that the universe had begun in an explosive instant 10 to 20 billion years ago, and had been expanding. The past perfect, remember, uh, should only be used when you're using it to uh, demonstrate a time prior to another verb in the sentence. Both verbs are past perfect. Um, well, I suppose they're both prior to um, Big Bang Theory holds, but um, the universe had to begin before it could begin expanding, so having both of those verbs in the same past perfect tense doesn't make sense. Choice C, it holds that the beginning of the universe was an explosive instant 10 to 20 years ago that has expanded. Um, so choice C incorrectly changes the meaning of the sentence. So we have the beginning of the universe was an explosive instant, which I guess metaphorically you could, you could say that, but then it's the instant that has expanded um, ever since. Because, so that phrase that has expanded, that goes back to instant. which I think uh, stretches the boundaries of metaphor far beyond what the GMAT would actually like, so that's not it. Uh, D, the beginning of the universe, wait, the Big Bang Theory holds the, the beginning of the universe to have been an explosive instant 20, 10 to 20 year, billion years ago, that is expanding. So once again, we have uh, instant that is expanding, which we need the universe to be expanding, not the instant. Also, um, holds the beginning of the universe to have been, it's also wordy. Not grammatically correct, but really awkward. Uh, lastly, choice E, uh, Big Bang Theory holds the universe to have, to have begun in an explosive instant 10 to 20 billion years ago and has been expanding. So we have to have begun and has been expanding. Here is an example of a not parallel so both of these are finite verbs, began and has been expanding. Um, beginning of the universe, to have uh, been is an infinitive, but then we have, um, oh sorry, it was to have begun, I was on choice D. To have begun and has been. This is a finite verb, a verb that's not the infinitive, like to run, to jump. Um, this is not parallel, having two here, but not having two there. So uh, that gets rid of the parallelism that we had in choice A, so choice A must be correct. And it sounded okay when we first read it, but we always have to be sure. 659, number nine. Like the idolization accorded the Brontes and Brownings, James Joyce and Virginia Woolf are often subjected to the kind of veneration that blurs the distinction between the artist and the human being. So, um, this is one of the easiest types of GMAT sentence correction ones to do. We have modifying phrase, comma, noun. I shouldn't have underlined that. One of these two things is often underlined and then the other one is not. Basically what you need to look for is that whatever is, that whatever is being used in the modifying phrase, here we have like the idolization accorded to the Brontes and Brownings, um, whatever comes after the comma needs to be the same type of thing. So in, in the sentence as written, we have idolization, 
and in the noun we have Joyce and Wolf, which are people. We either need to compare people to people or idolization to idolization. It's that simple. Make sure the same things are on each side of the comma, and this type of GMAT question is easiest. Um, and so what you actually need to do is look at which part is not underlined, and that's what needs to be in the underlined portion. The not underlined portion is people. So the only correct answer will have people in the modifying phrase rather than idolization or some other things. So A has idolization, not it. B has as the Brontes and Brownings idolization. Again, idolization for both of these. Uh, C has like that accorded to the Brontes and Brownings. That. We're, ca we're comparing that to people, which is not what we need. Choice D has as it is of the Brontes and Brownings. It? No. Like the Bront, and so we're on E. Like the Brontes and Brownings. James Joyce and Virginia Woolf. So here in, in E we have the actual people themselves rather than that or it or idolization. Um, like the Brontes and Brownings, the Joyce and the Wolf, okay? Or, you know, to make it sound even more parallel. So clearly, uh, so th that's, what, that's how these can often be some of the easiest sentence correction ones. Just look at whatever part's not underlined, you know, when you have, you know, these two things, mo an opening modifying phrase and then something after the modifying phrase. Um, these two things need to match. Start with the one that's not underlined, look for the answer choice that has that in the answer choice. Yeah, anyway, so people, we need to compare people to people. Bronte's Browning's James Joyce and Virginia Woolf. Choice E. Uh, 659, number 10. Carnivorous mammals can endure what would otherwise be lethal levels of body heat because they have a heat exchange network which kept the brain from getting too hot. Which kept. Problem here is the tense. Um, everything is, is um, present tense up until this point. Carnivorous mammals can endure what would otherwise be lethal levels of body heat because they have a heat exchange network. And so uh, everything is talking about this general state for carnivorous mammals. They can do this because they have this, which does this. So basically the correct answer needs to be in the present tense. So kept is past tense. That keeps, keeps is a present tense. We'll keep that as an option. Uh, which has kept, that's present perfect, which is a, it is a present tense, but it's present tense going right up until the present without necessarily describing it as an ongoing present action. Um, verb tense in English is pretty tricky. We add all these little words that slightly change the meanings and that can really um, make things difficult for non-native speakers. But has kept um, is different from keeps. Keeps is, hey, it just keeps, it, it's something that as far as we know is ongoing. Has kept says that up until the present anyway, this is what's going on. Like. Um, you know, wearing a seatbelt in the car has kept me from serious injury so far. There's no implication about that being a state that's going to continue indefinitely. Um, anyway, D, uh, that has been keeping, same thing. Um, that sort of ongoing action in the past up to the present date, but not necessarily covering the present and the likely future. So I guess... Um, See, so if this is now, <laughs> uh, keeps, a present tense verb is kind of like this. A uh, present perfect is like that, basically. Anyway, uh, choice E, having kept. Remember, be suspicious of being and having. The GMAT considers them extra words. And this is, no, this is another one, you know. Uh, they have a heat exchange network. Having kept the brain from getting hot, that's another kind of present perfect thing, saying, well, it's, it's worked so far, but it's not the same thing as this is what it does. And we expect that to continue. So choice B, simple present, which keeps, or excuse me, that keeps. And that's the other thing, you know, which versus that. Uh, you can see, um, you know, which without a comma in a... In a um, in a restrictive sense, but that's really rare. Normally it's comma which, 
don't do that, come on, okay, comma which or no comma that. And which, comma which is a non-restrictive thing which you're just providing, providing extra information. No comma with that is you're providing restrictive information that absolutely is crucial to understanding the sentence. Whereas comma which, you're providing stuff, you could eliminate that whole phrase and the sentence would still make sense. We'll, we'll run into that one again and I'll cover it again for sure. Because that's, a, that's, that's an issue, comma which versus that is something people have questions about a lot of times. Last but not least, question number 11. There are several ways to build solid walls using just mud or clay, but the most extensively used method has been the forming of bricks out of mud or clay, and after some preliminary air drying or sun drying, they are laid in the wall in mud mortar. Okay, so... Um, I guess we have some parallelism issues here. We have um, the forming of bricks, and after some preliminary air drying, they are laid. So um, I think we want some parallelism here. Um, you know, forming and then laying, uh, or you know, th they formed uh, and then laid the bricks. Bricks were formed and then laid. So we want parallelism in what happens to these bricks of mud or clay. Choice A has the forming and they are laid. So not parallel. Um, not A. Uh, B has forming uh, the mud or clay into bricks and after some preliminary air drying or sun drying to lay. So we have forming dot 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 to lay, another not parallel answer. C, having bricks formed from uh, mud or clay and blah, 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 they were laid. Um, not parallel. D, to form uh, the mud or clay into bricks and after some preliminary air drying or sun drying to lay them. Okay, so here we actually have parallelism. We'll keep D as an option. E, that bricks were formed from mud or clay, which, after some preliminary air drying or sun drying, were laid. Okay, so we have were formed and were laid. So we have to form and to lay were formed, were laid. So both of these are parallel, so clearly we have another issue between D and E. Um, and that, that issue basically is the word which in E. Um, which, when you have comma which, you know, <laughs> I mentioned we were going to talk more about it, and here's a little bit more. Um, that's going to refer most often to what comes immediately before. Um, what comes immediately before the which is mud or clay, which, after some preliminary air drying, were laid. It's not actually mud or clay, except by extension, because that's what the bricks are made of. They're not just laying mud or clay out, um, in, in the wall in mud mortar, they're laying out bricks. And so which actually needed to refer back to bricks, but since a couple other nouns came right before it, uh, it's ambiguous at least, and the default grammatically is that it's going to go right back here. It can go back further, but since it's ambiguous, the GMAT's not gonna like that, and um, that makes choice E the less preferable choice, um, and choice D the preferable one, because it doesn't have that ambiguity. Okay, so this concludes our first sentence correction broadcast. We're in the home stretch of the official guide. Thanks for listening. My name's Jim Jacobson, and you've been watching Grocket.com's OGTV, the GMAT edition. So we'll see you next time, or, well, I mean next time, whether you're watching this in a pre-recorded format or if you're tuning in live. So anyway, um, I hope to metaphorically see you there.